It's Wednesday, June 12. In the headlines, Jamaica secures 120 million US dollar loan from the World Bank. In business news, money moves. Honeybun Limited has acquired Swirls brand. Regionally, Haiti forms a new government as gang violence persists. And in sports, West Indies faces New Zealand in the ICC Men's T20 World Cup 2024. This is the news on PBC Jamaica. I'm Simone Absalom Gale. Finance Minister Dr. Nigel Clark says Jamaicans should not foot the bill for failed financial institutions. He says legislation is to be introduced to protect taxpayers from doing just that. He gave the details at Tuesday's meeting of the lower house at Gordon House. This move comes on the heels of the court's decision to recognize the jurisdiction of a trustee appointed by shareholders of Stocks and Securities Limited during the winding up of the entity over that of the temporary manager appointed by the Financial Services Commission. It is clear from the high-profile instances of fraud involving financial institutions and the funds of depositors and investors that there is need to strengthen the supervisory framework for all financial institutions. Dr. Clark first announced the government's intention to reform and enhance the system of supervision and regulation of the country's financial sector in January 2023 with a new Twin Peaks model. Under the new approach, uh, Madam Speaker, the prudential regulation of commercial banks, billing societies, merchant banks, microcredit, and eventually credit unions, along with non-DTIs, such as security dealers, insurance companies, and pension funds, being consolidated into one regulatory peak under the supervision of the BOJ. Similarly, all market conduct and consumer protection regulation will be consolidated under the other peak under a proposed Financial Services Conduct Authority, which will be the successor agency to the FSC. He says the new bill will give greater autonomy to the regulator. Under the new approach, uh, Madam Speaker, the prudential regulation of commercial banks, billing societies, merchant banks, microcredit, and eventually credit unions, along with non-DTIs, such as security dealers, insurance companies, and pension funds, being consolidated into one regulatory peak under the supervision of the BOJ. Similarly, all market conduct and consumer protection regulation will be consolidated under the other peak, under a proposed Financial Services Conduct Authority, which will be the successor agency to the FSC. Consumer protection will also be considered in the new bill. The Financial Sector Conduct Authority on full implementation of the Twin Peaks model will be responsible for market conduct regulation and financial consumer protection for all operators in the financial sector, whether they're DTI or non-DTI. So the people of Jamaica will have a consumer champion, as has long been advocated in this house, that is totally and solely focused on consumer protection across the financial services sector. Dr. Clark says the implementation of the Twin Peaks model is expected by 2026. Over 3,000 people will soon have increased access to potable water. Minister with Responsibility for Information, Dr. Dana Morris Dixon, made the announcement on behalf of Minister with Responsibility for Water, Environment, Climate Change and the Blue and Green Economies, Senator Matthew Samuda, at Wednesday's post-Cabinet press brief. He announced a 70,000-gallon tank for Constitution on Hill, a 50,000-gallon tank for Top Road in Mavis Bank, an approximately $100 million water project in Benedict's Height in Bull Bay. She says a new pipeline will be installed in Westphalia. Guava Ridge will have a new, um, their pump station will be upgraded, and there'll also be a new generator for the Long Mountain pumps, pump station. In addition to that, there is also more work being done in the forest for the Forest Hill Pipeline, um, and that will be done in August. There is also the $12 billion Rio Cobra water treatment plant, which we've spoken about, which will be able to transfer 15 million gallons of water to benefit approximately 150,000 customers 
or up and, and also many others who are in the Kingston and St. Andrew, Spanish Town and Portmore areas. The government's planned unemployment insurance program got a financial boost this week as Finance and Public Service Minister Dr. Nigel Clark signed a 20 million U.S. dollar loan agreement with the World Bank. The funds will be disbursed under a new project called Spiro, Jamaica Social Protection for Increased Resilience and Opportunities. At the time that firms are called upon to make those payments, we have found in our experience as a country that the firms may not be in a position to make the payments at that time. And so it's an imperfect system. Under unemployment insurance, it will allow Jamaicans who have lost their jobs due to no fault of theirs to, on a temporary basis, receive uh, a stipend from the government uh, calculated on a basis that is referred to their previous income and a cap, so to speak. He said there may be further consultations to fully establish a few parameters. We're very pleased to be working with the World Bank on this uh, through the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. There are parameters that we're going to have to finalize uh, in consultation. And uh, we have sort of given, in my budget presentation, sort of given a, an overview of some of the considerations. And we might well need to accompany this reform uh, with further reform on our statutory deductions. Uh, consolidation of our statutory deductions to ensure that the, we can do this in the most efficient way uh, for the vast majority of the population. When announcing the Employment Insurance Program in Parliament last month, Minister of Labour and Social Security Pernell Charles Jr. said the details of the proposed model, governance, management and investment strategy will be submitted to Cabinet for approval in the current financial year. The first woman to serve as a Speaker of Jamaica's House of Representatives, 93-year-old Violet Nielsen, has died. She spent her working years in service to the Jamaican people. She was a teacher and the first female president of the Jamaica Agricultural Society. She also served in several People's National Party administrations under Prime Minister P.J. Patterson. Ms. Nielsen died Tuesday afternoon while the House was in session. Current House Speaker Juliet Holness made the announcement on the motion for the adjournment of the sitting. Education and Youth Minister Favel Williams has emphasized the critical role played by school principals and teachers in creating conducive learning environments for students. Speaking at the Jamaica Association of Principals of Secondary Schools conference in Trelawney recently, she lauded their dedication noting their efforts to ensure both academic success and personal growth. Minister Williams emphasized the pivotal role educators play in shaping the nation's future through education, praising their commitment to providing conducive learning atmospheres, saying, quote, it cannot be lost on us, the important role being played by our educators and their willingness to go the extra mile to create an environment for their students that is conducive to learning. End quote. She also highlighted the admirable leadership of women principals in all boys' schools and male principals in all girls' schools, recognizing their role in shaping students as positive role models and instilling values for successful adulthood. Time now for the business report. Honeybun Limited has advised that effective June 1, 2024, the company acquired the Swirls brand. Honeybun has further advised that with this integration, the company plans to enhance its product portfolio, offering a wider variety of baked goods and meals to meet the growing consumer demand. Sagicor Select Funds Limited Select the investment company which operates to exchange traded investment funds, namely the Sagicor Financial Select Fund and the Sagicor Manufacturing and Distribution Select Fund, has advised of its intention to undertake a strategic reorganization, 
subject to obtaining all requisite approvals. That would result in the funds being converted into two unit trusts registered with Financial Services Commission and governed by the Securities Collective Investment Scheme Regulations 2013. In regional business, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, is urging the government of Trinidad and Tobago to resolve its foreign exchange shortages, emphasizing that this must be a top priority for the Twin Island Republic. In its latest Article 4, which was concluded on May 8, IMF directors issued a call to action regarding the ongoing foreign exchange challenges, insisting that an improvement in the way foreign currency is distributed and exchanged in the market is a necessity. They contend that this can be achieved by removing all restrictions on current international transactions and introducing a greater exchange rate flexibility over the medium term to help meet the demand for foreign exchange. Stay with us, Denise Williams has a breakdown of the latest financial market news. During trading for the period of June 11, 2024, the following companies represent the three most active stocks that investors bought and sold on the Jamaica Stock Exchange. Palace Amusement Company Limited with 1,717,853 units amounted to 16.79% of the market volume in terms of sales. Sagicor Select Funds Limited Manufacturing and Distribution with 1,564,405 units amounted to 15.29% of the market volume. Sagicor Select Funds Limited Financial with 1,472,323 units amounted to 14.39% of the market volume in terms of sales. Over on the Twin Island Republic of Trinidad and Tobago Stock Exchange, trading on June 11, 2024, registered a volume of 104,096 shares crossing the floor of the exchange, valued at 1,964,183 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 80 cents. NCB Financial Group Limited was the volume leader with 47,944 shares changing hands for a value of 133,284 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and 32 cents followed by National Enterprises Limited with a volume of 11,843 shares being traded for 39,000 788 Trinidad and Tobago dollars and eight cents. Moving from the money moves of investors, executives, and companies, we turn to the Forex market. On June 11, 2024, the Bank of Jamaica reported that US $53 million was bought from Forex traders, while US $77 million was sold to Forex traders. Buying directly from the Bank of Jamaica, foreign currency traders sold the U.S. dollar for $156.31 and bought the U.S. dollars for $154.93. The difference between the buy and sell rate was $1.38, which represents a profit for Forex traders for every U.S. dollar traded. Canadian Forex traders earned a trading profit of $0.60 cents from transactions with the Bank of Jamaica. The Canadian dollar was sold at $114.07 and bought for $113.47. For traders looking at the British pound, they pocketed a profit of $4.49, selling it for $199.83 and buying it for $195.34. For our credit report tip of the day in today's financial world, a strong credit score is more than just a number, it's a gateway to unlocking your full potential. A high credit score ensures that you're prepared for unexpected expenses and emergencies. This financial stability provides peace of mind, allowing you to focus on personal and professional growth. And with that, we wrap up today's business report. I'm Denise Williams, appreciate your company.
In regional news, Haiti's Transitional Council on Tuesday announced the formation of a new government, replacing all members of former Prime Minister Ariel Henry's cabinet as the country pushes to tackle economic woes and rampant gang violence. The announcement came two weeks after the council appointed Gary Conil, a former regional director for the United Nations Children's Fund, as interim prime minister and interior minister, a critical position that oversees the Haitian National Police. According to reports, several ministers in the new cabinet are from outside the country's political class. Dominique Dupuy, Haiti's representative at the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, will serve as the country's foreign minister. Carlos Hercule, former head of the Port-au-Prince Bar Association, who will head the Justice Ministry. Kathleen Florestal takes over as the finance minister. The defense ministry will be led by Jean-Marc Bothier Antoine. And the Education and Communication Ministries, meanwhile, will be jointly taken over by Antoine Augustine. Small islands developing states, SIDS, deserve financial justice and have every right to insist for developed countries fulfill their financial commitments to assist these islands. These strong words were championed by UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the recently held SIDS IV International Conference held in Antigua and Barbuda. Mr. Guterres outlined the challenges facing SIDS and the need for financial support for SIDS to mitigate the impact of climate change. And friends, SIDS also need and deserve financial justice. Small island developing states have every right and reason to insist that developed economies fulfill their pledge to double adaptation finance by 2025. And we must hold them to this commitment as a bare minimum. Many seeds desperately need adaptation measures to protect agriculture, fisheries, water resources, and infrastructure from extreme climate impacts you did virtually nothing to create. You also have every right to call for new and significant contributions to the loss and damage funds, and eventually to innovative forms of uh, mobilizing resources to this loss and damage fund, to make it a reality. Some of your countries have suffered damage worth more than half their GDP overnight by cyclones and storms. The UN Secretary General also spoke of reforms in the works to assist SIDS to achieve effective debt relief in the midst of climate change challenges, including the ability for SIDS to access concessional financing. That is the reason why I've called for an SDG stimulus to scale up resources for developing countries and to provide effective debt relief. And I repeat, effective debt relief. In the longer term, we are working for deep reforms to the outdated, dysfunctional, and unjust global financial architecture. We need a financial system that puts the interests of developing countries first and is able to work as a global safety net. And for SIDS, that means simplifying processes to access finance, and it means revisiting the rules for access to concessional financing to include the swift endorsement of the multidimensional vulnerability index. The SIDS International Conference was held in Antigua and Barbuda from May 27th to the 30th at the American University of Antigua. I'm Andre Huey for SKN Newsline. Barbados' Prime Minister, Mia Motley, advocates for a blue-green bank to bolster resilience in all facets of life amid the climate crisis, warning of the imminent threat of losing homelands and culture to rising temperatures. She supports the Barbados Blue-Green Bank Bill 2024, emphasizing its potential to provide affordable capital to companies and individuals. If we are not capable of adapting and becoming resilient, then the loss and damage that we face will be more acute. There is a direct relationship between mitigation, adaptation and resilience, and loss and damage. 
Now, Mr. Speaker, break it down now into simple language and Beijing. Mr. Speaker, if we keep using diesel buses and gasoline cars, it is going to add to the emissions. And who on the front line of that? All of the people who suffer from the hurricanes, suffer from the floods, the convection rain, I keep calling. We never had rain, but it gets so hot at 2, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the rain just got to whoosh, and it comes down in a deluge, a flood of rain, fast, 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 fast. What this government is doing today, with the passage of this legislation, is to create an instrument, a bank, that is appropriate to the times in which we live, and that will not function as your normal commercial retail bank on Broad Street, but that effectively marries the principles of both development banking and investment banking to act as a market maker, to be able to make it easier, to be able to make it better for persons to be able to unlock financing at a time when we have a date with destiny, a race, to be able to adapt and, yes, to become resilient. In sports, we look to cricket. The West Indies will aim to continue their winning streak, while New Zealand will be eager to bounce back from their previous defeat when the two teams clash tonight in the 26th match of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup 2024. The match will be taking place at the Brian Lava Cricket Academy at 7.30 p.m., West Indies have played two matches in this tournament so far, securing a position at second place in the points table. New Zealand, on the other hand, have played one match in the tournament and are currently placed fifth on the points table. Staking with cricket, the park and ride system is in full effect as organizers try to ease the traffic that is expected during the Trinidad and Tobago leg of the ICC Men's T20 World Cup. TTT Live has the details on its execution. Park your vehicle, hop on and hop off. This is the most recommended option presented to the public on getting to the Brian Lower Cricket Academy for T20 World Cup matches. But how exactly this works? Colonel Colin Millington of the Trinidad and the Tobago Defence Force spoke on how the park and ride system will function. Patrons show up at one of the designated venues, right? Uh, show your game day ticket, secure your vehicle, park your vehicle, hop on board one of the shuttles using your game day ticket, journey to the stadium in comfort, watch your game. Once the game is finished, hop back on a shuttle, go back to the same venue that you parked your vehicle, and then take your vehicle and leave. Now, some of the questions that came up in relation to this is, do I need a booking for the venue? There's no need for a booking. It's on a first-come basis. The venues for parking will be at the South Park Shopping Centre car park, which can accommodate 300 vehicles, and the Paria Fuel Trading Company's compound, formerly Petrogen, using the Gasparilla Gate. Paria's compound can accommodate 1,200 vehicles. Additionally, persons wishing to park and ride from North Trinidad, you also have that option. Um, on the 12th and 26th, as part of the park and ride service, you'll have the water taxi that will bring persons who want to use the water taxi from Port of Spain to San Fernando. The schedule for the water taxi is 5.30 p.m. It will leave Port of Spain. Patrons get on board, come to San Fernando, and then from the water taxi terminal in, in San Fernando, we'll do shuttles from there that will take persons to the Brian Lara Cricket Academy. We'll do one shuttle for all persons on board. The, the water taxi takes 400 persons, so we'll have transportation to deal with all those persons if we have capacity on game day. No need to worry about traffic from the water taxi terminal in San Fernando. You will get to the stadium in under 15 minutes. As for the regular shuttles, from South Park, you can hop on one of the services every five minutes and from Paria's compound every 10 minutes. Concerned about the safety of your vehicle? Colonel Millington says multiple agencies will have eyes on you and your property. The locations will be covered by CCTV and that will be monitored at the venue operating centre, at the stadium in itself and at the police OCC in Port of Spain. So you'll have persons looking at um, the venue and at Petrotrain, you have security there that um, will be looking 
after those vehicles alongside the TTPS and the TTDF. So your game day ticket is your access to utilize the park and ride system. Move smoothly to the venue, enjoy the game and head back to your vehicle all free of charge. Meanwhile, there is no surprise that tickets for the much-anticipated clash between the West Indies and New Zealand on Wednesday are nearing the sold-out marker. Speaking at the local organising committee's press conference, advisor to the LOC, Umar Khan, encouraged persons to part of this major World Cup event. Yes, for the West Indies-New Zealand game. Right, so far, the latest figure we have had is over 12,000 tickets have been sold. And as I said, they may look at releasing some additional tickets on Wednesday morning for sale for that game. But we expect the West Indies New Zealand game to be fully sold out and to be packed to capacity for that game. Of course, so the other games on Thursday, Friday and Monday, right, there are tickets still on sale for those games, lots of tickets. And we expect the general public to take the opportunity to be part of what you call a legacy item being hosted by Trinidad and Tobago, which is a World Cup event. We may not get another World Cup being hosted in the Caribbean for probably the next 10 years. So it's a great opportunity for the fans in Trinidad and Tobago, for the loving cricket public of Trinidad and Tobago, to go and witness a World Cup game, to be part of the World Cup, the ICC Men's C20 World Cup. Can also mention that some of the nation's junior students will have the opportunity to be part of this historic event. We are also having on Monday the 17th, um, CWI and ICC, what you call the Good for Schools program, where a number of primary and secondary schools throughout the country will be invited to attend those, the game on Monday the 17th between New Zealand and Papua New Guinea at 10.30 a.m. in the morning. That's the only day game, as you know, we are having. That's on Monday the 17th at 10.30 a.m. And we have engaged in a program with the Ministry of Education and with all with CWI and ICC that all primary and secondary schools in the country have been invited to send a contingent to attend the games. Right? Over 5,000 tickets will be distributed to the schools, primary and secondary schools, for that game on Monday. And we expect a lot of school children and a lot of um, students to come and witness the World Cup game. And that's it for the news on PBCJ. Pleasant viewing.